This is the GPL Podcast, part of the Pull Tab Sports family. So right away, my confidence is it's doing really, really, really well before that. And then um, and then Don goes, can anybody on the ice take a penalty shot? And the referee goes, no, it has to be, it has to be Ramsey. And I'm like, okay, there's shot two to the confidence. That's, that's great. And he, and he... You know, I, I think there is some shenanigans happening. In the goalie community, are you, you going to speak on that? In as, the goalie as a, community, oh, you know, former goalie. You know, I got to ride with goalie nation, but um... <laughs> now here's Jupiter and Vigo. Good evening, and welcome to the GPL podcast, episode number two hundred and fifty-eight. Vigs. Good evening. How are you tonight? Doing awesome. This is a great part of the year. Things are starting to ramp up. People are paying attention to the pairwise. They're looking at conference standings, where teams might be going for conference tournament play. Podcast has been a little crazy this week. Yeah, there's been a lot of news this week for people to talk about. So I'm glad to see that the NCAA regionals discussion is going on still. Yes. And I'm glad to see that we're starting to find out what is goalie interference. <laughs> no, I don't think we've actually figured that out yet. But what, what we'll see. We Maybe do? we can get some help tonight on this this controversy. Well, we might be able to get some help here. We've got a guy who's new to the show, but not new to many of you. You, if you followed any Penn State hockey or even the Frozen Four, I guess you just say hey, Viggs. He's he's been calling that the last couple of years as well. He's a man around college hockey. He is He's brave it's to come Brian, on with us. Yeah, Brian Tripp. Let's bring him in. Brian, thanks for joining the show. No problem. I'd say first time, long time, but I, I got to be honest, I just skimmed a couple episodes to get ready for this thing. <laughs> That's quite all right. You know, we had some back and forth with Cappy a couple weeks ago. He's like, Yeah, you should get this guy on. I'm like, Yeah, we've been needing a Penn State guest forever since since they joined the league. We haven't found you guys one, but... come highly recommended. And after I heard that you may crack crack a beverage during the overtime, I'm like, I'm all in. These are my people. Yeah, uh, Viggs cracks something every week, and on special occasions, I do drink a, a bit more than I should. But that's the fun about it. We we have fun. That's that's the key. So, what can what can you do? So, thanks for joining us. We'll get into more of some of the stuff you do. Uh, in a bit here, but uh, Viggs, big weekend in Wisconsin this past weekend. A po- a, a split uh, for points, but a little bit more for pairwise than, you know, a split would be. Yeah, just a reminder to all our college hockey fans out there, when you get a win on the road, whether it's in regulation or in the three-on-three, you get that bonus percentage in the pairwise which is what we're all concerned about right now so a win and a tie for minnesota actually helps them overall as a weekend it's kind of like a winning weekend for them so you see them get that boost in their pairwise and really solidify their place right now in that two three c range you start looking at some of the sites out there that project where teams can finish it means minnesota is pretty solid in that 98 percent to make the tournament and now they're starting to get in that position where they can play for seeding. Well, you know, I, I I picked, you know, four points for the Gophers past weekend, and, you know, I thought they would lose the overtime, then win. But then they have winning in overtime Friday night. Uh, excellent play, and actually not a bad game all, all around, was it? Well, Friday they had to weather the storm. I think they did. The Badgers did. really came after Minnesota, and Minnesota leaned on their goaltending and their structure probably a little bit more than the fans would like. You know, Justin Close, I think he saw 40 shots, maybe 41, I think, during the play on Friday. So that's a lot of action for him to see. And he held his ground. I know a he lot did. of people have been critical about Close over the years. You know, that he's an average goalie to slightly above. Well, he definitely showed out on Friday and earned the Big Ten number one star of the week with that kind of play. And I think for Minnesota to do something this year, they need Justin Close 
to be that goalie and be reliable in games where Minnesota has to withstand pressure and defend. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're going to get into goalie interference a little bit later, but all in all, Saturday, a, a much better game. Um, couldn't quite get those goals to get the win. Lose in a shootout yet again. Um, but they did play much better, and they did lock down Wisconsin a lot more they did than they did, especially for the second period on Friday night. Yeah, I thought they controlled play much better on Saturday than on Friday. You know, Bob called it one of the best games he's seen in his six years mm-hmm. uh, in the Big Ten. And Minnesota maybe deserved more than what they got out of that night. Uh, but I think what Gopher fans have to keep in mind is they played well. And I brought this up to Bob today at availability is as a coach, you have to be happy with a team that has all this noise. And I'm not talking about the sellout crowd at the Kohl Center. I'm talking about the officials, maybe not making calls that go in your way. Uh, maybe officials who aren't calling any penalties and they're letting a lot of clutching and grabbing and stick work go. And you still hold your game plan and you play consistent throughout regulation and overtime. And you don't really give the Badgers grade A scoring chances and you continue to work with your ground game and control the puck. And that's winning hockey. And I think when you're looking at Minnesota and you're looking for signs of maturity, being able to have a night like that where things aren't going right for you and you don't pout, you don't get Mm -hmm. distracted. You stay focused and you stay in the rock fight as we talk about in a game like that. So that's, that's important. I think for Minnesota to see, because if that game kept going, you know, if you were playing 20 minute overtimes, I think Minnesota fans would have been happy to see that happen. (laughs) Okay. And on the flip side, Brian, you guys had a nice little weekend off. Um, Hopefully, you got. Hopefully, the team got a chance to recharge. Did you get a chance to recharge? I saw you doing some videos from from wrestling. You know, kind of during that off week. How busy were you this past week? Yeah, so I do the broadcasting of the hockey games. It's just a small part of my job. I work as feature yeah. content specialist with all thirty one teams here. So I actually missed probably the first month of hockey season traveling with football. Uh, mm-hmm. I just got a couple of games in early in the year. So, no, I, I did not recharge too many of my batteries during the off weekend. Uh, the hockey team did. They had a sled hockey classic, great fundraiser on I Saturday for, yeah. Yeah. for the State College Coyotes organization. And they raised more than $17,000. It was the second time doing it. They had nearly 500, 800 people there in attendance. Uh, really cool activity on Saturday morning. But the team was, they were honestly a little banged up after the Ohio State series, mm-hmm. illness kind of running through a little bit. It actually did come, you know, even though they got some momentum finally against Ohio State, played well, saw special teams, goaltending get on track. Uh, I think it did come at a good time for them. But overall, I mean, it's 50 and sunny in State College last weekend, so the, the bye weekend did come with the weather being pretty nice. It's been that way here, too. It's, it's, well, by the time, you, well, it'll be warm tomorrow. You guys are coming tomorrow, but yeah. it's going to get cold again. But you're going to get here and there's no snow. It's brown. It's ugly. It's not February. Um, but you mentioned uh, sled hockey. I enjoy that. I love watching the Olympics. Uh, I want to say those guys are beyond athletes, what they can do. I mean, you know, some of them have literally no legs and the strength and the balance they have out there. It's just, it's not just inspiring. It is just like, it's jaw dropping at times. Yeah. The Dylan Lugris, who's up for the hockey humanitarian, he's a junior forward on the Penn State team. He recognized that this team needed a way to find a way to get funding for ice time, equipment, mm-hmm. anything. And they didn't have it. So they started going to their practices and doing anything they can to participate, help. And they were gassed, like completely gassed after the the game last week when they played. Uh, Guy Gadowski, he's gone to the practices to the head coach. He actually played for the sled hockey team, the guys who are, are always playing, guys and girls who are always playing in that. And he deflected the game-winning goal in for them. So I think he's been telling the players about it all week. But to watch the Penn State hockey team, Division One athletes, try to sled around on the ice. Uh, there are a couple of guys with like training wheels on, guys going into the boards. Uh, they're pretty fortunate no one got hurt doing this thing. Uh, but it, but it's really cool how they've embraced it. Uh, and not only was it this event, they've been going to practices every Sunday with them and trying to help them find ice time. And, you know, it shows that hockey really is for anyone. 
Um, and I think the event was so much fun. Uh, it, it was just as much fun to see the the sled hockey team out there and then to see how bad the Penn State hockey players were at the sled hockey itself. Like I said, it's it's not easy. I, I could not imagine doing it. I could barely do regular hockey leagues. You've seen me play. I could barely do that. Yeah, I'm always impressed with the sled hockey players, uh, just like the wheelchair rugby players. I think that's gotten a little bit more national attention over the years. You know, the people who get in that, there's documentaries on that. I think sled hockey is something that maybe those documentary people should be taking a look at because sled hockey is just as fantastic and the stories are just as amazing. Mm -hmm. And and a, and a big thing for former Badger coach uh, Jeff Sauer before he passed away was his involvement in sled hockey was gigantic in their success. Yeah, it's, it's huge to see people get involved and give back and, and get that experience because I think you know it's rewarding not only for the sled hockey players but for the people who volunteer as well. So a good way to recharge, Brian. I did have we have two TVs in the living room. Did have both TVs up streaming games all weekend too. So so watch watch anything we could. I mean, you're, you're hockey people. That's what you're gonna. That's what you're gonna do on Friday did, and did, Saturday night. Did you use Big Ten Plus to stream all those games? Big Ten Peacock Notre Dame was on Peacock too. So oh yeah, you, know, you got that too. I I was watching games all weekend on Big Ten Plus, and I hear people complaining and why isn't this game on TV? We we talked about that last week with, with Todd Molesky. There's reasons behind it. Um, but Viggs, I'd love big 10 plus and I, you know, I, it was great. I had, you know, the Minnesota game up on my big screen TV. I had the Michigan, uh, game on my laptop, just kind of chicken in with that. I, I think it's a great service. I need, we got to get people to embrace this thing. It's part of the big 10 moving forward. And I know some people are having a hard time with some of the announcers that are, putting on some of these broadcasts, you know, that's up to the host school, what they choose to do, you know, if, who they have behind the mic, but the the product is pretty good. You know, I compare big 10 plus to the NCHC service. And I think big 10 is a little bit ahead. You know, I just got my peacock getting ready for uh, some mm -hmm. Gopher hockey series. I got to see the Michigan state, Minnesota basketball game last night that the Gophers won. I was actually at Williams arena to see the Gopher basketball team beat Northwestern this past weekend. So, you know, it's, it's the way of the future and the big 10 is investing in a lot of these things and it's, it's pretty dependable. And we had that one announcement uh, with ESPN and a couple other entities. They want to do their own new streaming service. Sounds like their own kind of cable thing. Almost. It sounds like a big bundle. I think it'll be streaming. It's just going to be combining a lot of the sports fan channels okay. into one. It's just going to be another option for people. You know, we're still going to want Big Ten Plus. We're still going to want Peacock. Eventually, I think Paramount is going to be coming in for basketball and football. So stay tuned, mm -hmm. everyone. So, Brian, you know, we mentioned you do the Frozen Four. How long have you been doing hockey itself? Yeah, I started doing when Penn State went and joined the Big Ten. So this is the 11th year that I've oh, been Oh, so doing you're the hockey. reason why this is all messed no, up. No, do not. Do, I, I know the audience. <laughs> do not put that on me. <laughs> I know the audience. I'm not, yeah, uh, 11 years. <laughs> not fall into that lion trap, Jube. No. He just right. saw there's, it. There's no chance. Walked around. <laughs> very smart. But I think, you know, the Big Ten, you know, as much as it's been bad for Minnesota, it's been great for Penn State. You know, Penn State has a yeah. great rank, great building, great for the fan base. I think it's good for hockey in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like Big Ten hockey has been pretty good for all the other schools. And now that Wisconsin and Michigan State have new coaches, you know, they're, they're back. Like, mm -hmm. Minnesota has seen good atmospheres the last two weekends. And when they go I to Penn State every time, it's for... great. Yeah, I don't think it's been bad for Minnesota. When you look at the success they had the first four years, the run they've been on now, I think it's just taken, you know, look, it's, it's a sport where you want rivalries, and there's been building rivalries for decades. And to play you know, St. Cloud and Minnesota Duluth and all those great teams up in the state, yeah, I mean, you want to play your rivals. It's, a, it's a, just a different embrace of it. But when you look at the success, four teams pretty much every year now getting into the NCAA tournament in the Big Ten, uh, two teams last year in the Frozen Four, a couple years, three teams in the Frozen Four. The Big Ten, yeah, they haven't cracked through and won one yet. Uh, really thought it was coming probably four or five years ago. I think it's just taken a while to embrace because, you know, it is different. Um, but overall, I think the league's been really good. 
uh, TV exposure on national television yes. on Big Ten Network, FS1, has been really good. Um, I think when Penn State joined, you thought that that would be the impetus for other big schools to make the jump. You know, not your LIU's, Lindenwood's, yeah. Augustana's of the world to make the jump to Division One hockey. And, you know, by now, I think we thought you'd have an Illinois, uh, a Northwestern, like mm -hmm. who else in the league was going to jump and do it? Would it be opening the door to Southern hockey in the SEC? Would some of these Pac-12 schools besides Arizona State make that leap? And because it hasn't infiltrated other Power 5 leagues and whatever it's going to look like now that all the conference realignment's happening again, I think that's where you know you start to get that divide into why, why was this significant, why wasn't it? Um, uh, but overall, I think it's been really good for the sport. You now have a Power 5 voice with the Big Ten, the commissioners, uh, having that voice at the table at an NCAA level. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I do still think there's room to grow the league. And I think there's room to grow the game amongst major conference teams. Um, I've been surprised that it hasn't happened yet, but, but completely understand the consternation among many uh, for a team that's been in a program that's been unbelievable, unbelievably successful, but they've done it since they've joined the league too. So it, it, I don't know that it, it's hurt go for hockey. And obviously what Bob's done the last couple of years to get them back to where, you know, I think people think they should be every year uh, proves that you can do it and do it at a high level in this league. I think it's more about nostalgia, but I think rivalries are huge. And Vs, I'm not sure this rivalry of Penn State was that good until Penn State started kicking Minnesota's butt every time. Oh, I think that made a big difference. I think the players for Minnesota realized they were going into a tough atmosphere at Penn State. And it just kind of grew a little bit of hate, you know, as, you know, Pavlichev and Smirnov and Barrett, you know, started chirping the gopher bench and, and there started to be some bad feelings there. You know, that built up. I just don't know if the fan base at Minnesota has totally embraced the rivalries of the Big Ten outside of Michigan and, and Wisconsin. You know, they're they're growing, but there's a lot of fans who do crave the local rivalries and you know, you look at Minnesota, they're always going to be scheduling four series against in-state schools. They're just going to be rotating through who they play and who they skip. So they'll still do their best to maintain those while they continue to build the Big Ten rivalries. Because there aren't yeah. bad teams in the Big Ten. Though. Everyone's got a good budget. Everyone's got good support. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of good hockey players in the country. And a lot of them really like playing at Big Ten schools because of all the support they get. And, and it looks like we're going to have good crowds this weekend. Oh, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I was just going to say, you have unbelievable environments, unbelievable buildings um, with what Wisconsin's done in bringing Hasty there. And I think Adam Nightingale at Michigan State, you know, there, there are no bad teams in the league right now. Ohio State has, has a bit of a down year, but they were one win from a Frozen Four last year. You know, Penn State's sixth in the league, but one shot from going to the Frozen Four last year. Um, and I think Guy and Steve has had as many 20-win seasons as anyone else in the league during the last seven to eight years. But I just think the league, the margin between the teams is so thin. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you look at what, four or five points separating second to sixth place last year in the conference standings. Uh, I just think every team is really, it's it's really good. And the Big Ten, you haven't had that that basement. You know, even in the NCHC, there's been a gap between top three, four teams and the bottom teams. You know, maybe a Wisconsin, maybe a Michigan State here or there. But you haven't had that in the Big Ten. The depth of the league, I think, is what separates it from the other leagues, um, you know, NCHC and probably Hockey East. Yeah, I've heard Bob joke sometimes it would be nice to have an eighth team be a basement team because there's no easy weekends <laughs> in the conference. And, you know, you just invite Illinois and Northwestern and they could be that team for a couple of years, you know, It'd just be fine with him. Well, people I, thought it was going to be Penn State for about five, six, seven, ten years, and it took about three years. And when they went on that Big Ten tournament run, all of a sudden they're in the NCAA tournament and have Denver in a regional final. Uh, I think even here, look, everyone knew that it was going to be tough, but to have the success they had against Blue Bloods, Michigan, Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin from basically year one, year two, uh, it caught a lot of people by surprise. But it's a credit to what Guy did to, to get them to that point and the people that that they brought in, you know, they identified players that had a chip on their shoulder and wanted to, to prove something at this level. And now it's about finding the players 
that can get you to sustain success and, and compete against teams that have had players that are going one and done to the NHL. Well, it's definitely an exciting time. We're, we're going to get into that Penn State series later because, you know, Vegas, you talk about the rivalry. It's We're looking like at a full barn at least on Saturday. They, they announced a sellout for that, I, I believe, over a week ago. Yep, I think there's a lot of youth hockey groups that yeah. want to get there, so there's going to be some young energy in there and, and growing new fans. So I think it should be a great atmosphere this weekend. I know the players are looking forward to it as well. All right. Well, one thing we need to do, Viggs, is talk about one of our sponsors here. And you know, our sponsor, a new sponsor last week, Will Anderson Insurance, is now on board with us. Yeah, Will Anderson. He's a hockey guy. He played for the Gophers. Mm-hmm. Fixture in his hometown community. Always giving back. But you should close your eyes and think of your insurance agent. Who is it? Someone you used to know decades ago in high school, friend of a friend, ex-boyfriend or girlfriend. Now ask yourself, what has your insurance person done for you lately? Are they saving you money? Will they answer the phone when you call? Do you even know their number? Or better yet, reach out to our sponsor, Will Anderson Insurance. Simply put, Will insures you the same way he'd insure his own family. While we can't promise he'll save you money, let's just say you should sure get a quote. Call 612-361-7283 or visit willandersonagency.com. All right. Of course, we thank Will Anderson Agency for being a sponsor. And then we've also got Yoakum Real Estate Group, Viggs. If you're in the market to buy or sell a house, tis the season. It's a little known fact that Super Bowl Sunday here in the Midwest is the official trigger point to list your home or start looking. And if you're going to the market, whether you're buying or selling, don't roll the dice on your biggest asset. Sarah and Jody bring different skill sets to the table. Sarah's a lawyer by trade, ready to help you see around corners. And Jody is a born creative, there to unlock your vision and creative side. Call the twins at Yoakum Real Estate and visit yoakumrealestategroup.com for more info. All right. And of course, we thank Yoakum Real Estate as well. Let's bring Brian back to the conversation. I I know Viggs wants to talk about this, but Brian, I want to know, can you define goalie interference for me? (laughs) I mean, certainly watched the games last week. I'll say this. Even head contact, all the stuff in the Big Ten this year. I just wish there was more consistency from week to week. That Yes. That's I just want consistency week to week in the league. I, I don't feel like you have uniformity amongst the officiating crews week to week. Oh, oh, hold on a second. Wait, look at this. Who's watching the show right now but Cappy himself? Where's his finder's fee? Uh, Cappy, I heard you, you didn't even pay for lunch. Cappy, maybe we'll get you a gift card that you can use next time you see Tripper on the road. <laughs> He paid for half. Oh, I mean, oh, we love throwing Cap. Got to throw Cap into the bus if he's watching. <laughs> Sorry, that was a little too easy. Um, Viggs, your thoughts? <laughs> Sorry for the distraction there, but well, I just think something like goalie interference and head contact is a judgment call. Uh, Steve Piotrowski, Big Ten head of officials, was on a show this week to talk with uh, Jim Conley and Ed, and he said. You know, even when they do training and they go over, you know, six head contact or six goalie interference, very rarely does their group all 100% agree on every call. So a lot of these things, you get different camera angles and different perspectives. I'm sure most of the people listening to our podcast right now feel like the Gophers have been cheated out of three goals. Um, I'm not going to out Fight Club 30 on our message board about his explanation, but he's a former D1 hockey ref, and he looked at each call and he said, yep, I can see what the ref was seeing on all these, and I agree with him that they're all no goals. It's frustrating, I think. You know, I saw the first Nelson goal of the three as clear interference because he definitely could have avoided the goaltender. The second one with Oliver Moore getting pushed into the crease and making very, very light contact with McClellan, and the goal gets waved off, very surprising to me. Uh, The third one, the only reason it's an issue is because McClellan tried to milk getting knocked over. You know, if he just gets up right away, he's probably in clear position to make a save, but instead he's trying to milk it for some sort of injury. 
that's where now as a ref, you've bailed him out for doing that. And so it's kind of a challenging thing there. You know, I, I retweeted a video from, I think, four or five years ago, Minnesota and Wisconsin, where a gopher player got checked into the net and Ben Brinkman got a goal. You know, the ref said, hey, you did that to your goalie. I'm not bailing you out. So it's very much a judgment call. It, it is a judgment call, but in this specific case, Viggs, McClellan had a chance to get up, squared up to Brodzinski. Brodzinski made a pass. He started getting squared up to that. Didn't make the save. That's where I think a lot of people had some issues with it. Yeah, it it's a judgment call. And the ref judged that that collision was enough of a factor that he was going to wave it off. It's not written or explained clear enough where he's clearly wrong. Mm-hmm. It's clearly a judgment, and clearly his judgment differs from Bob Motzko's judgment. But that's why he wears the stripes, and Coach Motzko wears the sweater vest. Now, you know, my kind one... of my thought on this, Brian, is that yeah, I think you know the ref's standing there in the corner watching this happen. He sees he sees Nelson kind of get tripped, and like oh, he tripped into the gully. Oh boy. I haven't blown the whistle yet. All of a sudden, five seconds later, the puck goes into the net. And it's a good two seconds before he goes, yeah, no, not a goal. And for me, I'm thinking in his head, I might have messed up messed up a couple calls here. I, ooh, I better. We're all human. And we all like, ooh, oh, maybe I, should, I shouldn't have missed that. That's just kind of my thinking along this, but. This could decide a national title championship game down the road for any amount of teams. I was just going to say, we had one, the second one that you referenced where, you know, I thought it was hard from the overhead angle to really see when I think it was Vorlicky and more and Vorlicky kind of hit him back into, into the goalie. You know, we had one where even if you don't contact the goalie, but you're positioned in the crease as more was, if you're in the crease and you're taking away the goalie's sight line to the puck, it is interference. So I, I think like you couldn't tell when Vorlicky initiated that contact to, to bump him in, but if he was positioned there before Vorlicky even added to it and bumped him into McClellan, like I didn't have a problem with that one. I, I agree with you guys on the third one. I think there's a lot of amb- ambiguity on the third one that you're talking about, but the second one, like I, I can see that one based on how it's been called before and where Moore's positioning was in the crease. Vigos, you get that look in your face, Vigos. What do you got? <laughs> <laughs> I also think in an NCAA tournament, the judgment changes a little bit. You know, this is just a regular season game where this is the way things have been going. You know, it's not as big of a seen to wave off a goal. Mm-hmm. I think in the NCAA tournament, you know, things are maybe a little bit different and maybe that's a good goal. Cause you know, one thing in college hockey and NHL hockey, you know, we, we try so hard to create situations where there can be offense. And when you're giving the defense ways to bail out your goalie, you know, you're starting to get into a slippery slope for me. Is, a, is it now a strategy to, to bump players into your crease to make contact with your goalie if they're not going to call anything there? It's it's just not great for the game if that's going to be where we're going. And I did hear, I know that uh, we we got Eric Brever here saying that Big Ten agrees they're wrong. I talked to somebody at the university today and he affirmed that the Big Ten says it's a judgment call, and their referee has the judgment to make the decision the way they made them. So I don't know if it's quite the right. I think Jess thinks that the Big Ten maybe thought they were wrong, but no, I heard I heard a little bit different. So and Breffer's a lawyer, so. <laughs> Oh, it, it it it's it's just a tricky situation. Um, it's one weekend. I, it's it's not the worst thing in the world, Biggs. Um, I, the one thing I, I had another note here. Uh, shootout becoming a sick joke for the Gophers. 
and I know you don't put much emphasis on this, but I'm thinking, and you see them practice this every week. Maybe they should just stop practicing. That's what I think. I, I think they should stop practicing for a while and just go into the game cold instead of, you know, working on shootout moves. Cause I, I always thought that the best thing to do on a breakaway and a shootout is to read the goalie, not predict in your mind what you're going to do. So if you spend your time working on a shootout move and the goalie does something different, you're not really even paying attention to it. You're putting yourself at a disadvantage. So, so maybe not practicing is, is the way to go for a little bit. Cause I, I really think that the big 10 race is maybe out of reach unless somebody really falls on their face down the stretch here. And these points don't really matter that much in the big picture. Cause Minnesota's not playing for a big 10 title this year. I don't think the fans would be satisfied if the Gophers won a Big Ten title and then we're out in the first round of the NCAA tournament. This is a team that's building for a Frozen Four run, so that's where they're putting their time. Brian, how has Penn State done on the the shootout? You know, I'm looking here. Minnesota has never had gone to a shootout with Penn State. Yeah, well, Penn State, you know, as long as I've been doing this, they did not play a lot of overtime shootout games. I think it's because of their style of play and and the wide open style that they have. Um, This year, first three Big Ten games, all overtime, you know, you have ties, and and they've done well this year. Um, I think Soulier is a pretty good shootout goaltender uh, when he's been in. And having a freshman like Aiden Fink to finish has really helped, and they've got some guys that, you know, you always think like, it's going to be the top guys on the team that are going to score. And I think last year they had an eight round shootout or something like that with, with Notre Dame. And it was, I think it was the Burke that doesn't score scored for Notre Dame to win the shootout. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and when you look at Minnesota, when you think Snuggerud and you know the team they had last year, but especially some of the guys this year still like, yeah, who's going to beat the Gophers in a shootout, but it, it just doesn't play out that way. It definitely doesn't because, you know, their last win in a shootout was uh, February 14th of 2020 against (laughs) Notre Dame. Only one goal was scored in it, and that was Brandon McManus. Somebody, I think you want to get on the podcast eventually, don't you, Viggs? I was just saying, when you got to get Brandon on the podcast, maybe a Notre Dame week would be perfect for him. You know, you can open some wounds on that rivalry and, and share his expertise on the shootout. Because it's just hard to believe. Because you would think Rhett Pitlick and Jimmy Snuggerud would be two great shootout options. Snuggerud with the great shot, Pitlick with the great hands. You know, he Pitlick comes in on his shootout attempt going 100 miles an hour. I don't know if that's the right strategy, but you know, <laughs> Rhett's Rhett. He's going to do what he wants to do. But uh, and and Close was trying some new stuff this last weekend. He was coming way out of his crease to try to play the guys in, and didn't work for him either. So. We've got some bad juju right now on the shootout. They do. Yeah, just if you see him start practicing, just, just yell down to Bob, no, don't Stop. do it. Stop. <laughs> Bring a whistle with. I'll give the three hard whistles. <laughs> go. I'll say full time. Everybody <laughs> off. I, it's, it's just, it's been the goofiest thing, Brian. Like you said, you have all these so-called superstars, but obviously it's a different situation at the end of a game. You might be tired, but. I think it's just a goofy stat for Minnesota. I mean, seven in a row, seven games in a row. They haven't even scored a goal in a shootout. The Flyers had that going for them for a little <laughs> while, too. Like, <laughs> a little different there, right? Uh, yeah. But I think it's just an odd coincidence. I was going to say you should have yeah. had McManus instead of me this week. And no. they scored a hat trick against <laughs> Penn State the one year. <laughs> like, of all hey. people, come on. <laughs> come on. It, it's it's just it's just a goofy thing. I, I I think it's a great topic because you know, it's it's cost them four points this year. Vegs, they could have been like just a point or two behind Wisconsin right now if they hadn't lost some of those points. It adds up over the time. I mean, you know, when I look at the the times they've done it. You know, they did it a lot last year, a little bit this year, but then you know, in like in a couple seasons, they hadn't had any shootouts. So it. it it kind of goes all over the place. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I don't mind the shootout being part of the game because the NHL uses it. I know in college you play a lot fewer games, so mm-hmm. maybe it's a little more important. But I but I like that you get that point, you know, going into overtime, and this is just a bonus point that gets awarded. You know, if you start, you know, just having overtime ties, you get a point and a half. You know, mm-hmm. do you have to re- reset your point structure to handle that? 
Uh, you know, the NCAA had to go through all these hoops to get everybody to agree to do this three on three mm -hmm. so that you could have pairwise points in overtime. I'm, I'm fine with it. I think it's just, you know, this is just the, the roll of the dice here for a little bit for Minnesota. They'll get past it. I like Andrew Carlson here, Viggs. I've been waiting for someone to just rip a Brian Rolson slapper to break the seal. A clapper. You can clap. Clap uh, bomb. He, he, Rolston just wound up when he was doing those shootouts. Ryan Chesley. Ryan Chesley's going to come in, take a, a so? big bomb right between the hash marks. <laughs> I would love to see it. Go. I mean, change up. Why, why not? Exactly. It, it would definitely be fun. Well, let's get into this week in a bit here. But, Viggs, we need to talk about a couple more of our sponsors here. Cub Foods. That was just in the Shock P1 the other day. I got myself some nice, warm chicken tenders for myself. They have the best tenders. But they have a lot of other stuff, too. Yeah. Cub loves sports. Loves Minnesota. They're one of us. You should visit them. They sponsor their wild podcasts on 7th. Sponsor the Twins, Homer Hankies. They're on PJ Flex headset. They're with Pull Tab Sports here, and they've got stores all around your neighborhoods. And uh, you know, whatever you're looking for, food and beverage, they've got fresh milk, they've got great produce, uh, a lot of options. They got pickup, they got delivery, they got wine and spirits now. If you need a pale ale or some THC drinks, you know, check out Cub. Uh, everything you need, one of us, they're awesome. Go Cub. Yeah, yeah, they definitely are. And we thank them for being. A podcast sponsor of ours. And of course, Duke Cannon is definitely a sponsor of this podcast. Jake Middleton here, Director of Hair and Hygiene for the Minnesota Wild. How did I get this important role with the team, you ask? I'd like to think it was because of hard work, but the truth is, I run hot. Yep, I'm a sweater. In my role as Director of Hair and Hygiene, I'm sort of like a player coach. Let me pull out the grease board here. Well, it's not actually a grease board because there is nothing dirty about Duke Cannon. How do I help the guys stay squeaky clean? Helpful reminders. It's simple. Tarp saw, Duke Cannon on. Say it with me. Tarp saw, Duke Cannon on. Tarp saw, Duke Cannon on. Pick the scent that suits you. Sawtooth. Thick body wash. Extra thick. And my favorite, Midnight Swim. Tarps off, do Cannon on. Do Cannon. Work harder, smell better. All right, we're all back here, and Penn State's coming to Mariucci this weekend, Viggs. What are you looking forward to? Well, we've often said that Guy Godowski has chaos hockey as his mantra. I feel like he's tried to get away from that a little bit and put a little more structure into his team's play. But I think, you know, the DNA of Penn state is lots of shots, get the defenders turning their back to the four check and having to regroup and organize themselves under a lot of pressure and stress. And Minnesota historically had a hard time with that, you know, in that stretch where Penn state was kind of dominating the series Gopher defensemen were having a hard time getting back and retrieving pucks off those shots. They were losing players in front of the net, and that just became a really bad situation for Minnesota. You know, when you had all the NHL defensemen that Minnesota's had the last couple of years, that kind of disappeared because the defense were so sound. I think we saw in the first game of this series earlier in the year, maybe a little bit of a concern for Minnesota as they started mm -hmm. to lose track of Penn State players and, and drop that first game. You know, they cleaned it up for the second one, but I think it's definitely a concern coming in this weekend how they handle that. Definitely a concern. And, uh, Brian, you guys are traveling tomorrow, I believe you mentioned, heading out here. What's your favorite – before we get into it, what's your favorite place to eat when you come here? Besides Surly Brewery and the drink. Oh, that – that's a tough one. You know, the team, the team, and you know, we're kind of separate from the team right now, mm -hmm. just the way it works out. We had been going to to Hoyts for a couple of years. Mm. That was pretty good. I know why you took me off the screen for the last ad, by the way. <laughs> no offense. I was going to get you some products for coming on the show, Brian, but I'm gonna, I might have to go into something else. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, my hair's white, but I still got plenty of it. So, Rub it no, JD Hoyt's is always good. Good pork chop. You know, that's oh, a, yeah. that's a favorite for Gopher Athletics around here as well. So, Definitely. it's hard to go wrong. We, we've got a pretty good food town here in, in Minneapolis. Gosh, I haven't I haven't been at Mariucci since uh, CC Beagues that vacation, and then all of a sudden these road series. It, it's going to be nice to actually get back to Mariucci. Uh, you, which games are you planning to come to this weekend, Beagues? I'm planning on the Saturday afternoon game. I've got two youth hockey players that are going to be joining me for my trip to Mariucci, along with some swag. Uh, I know we'll be tweeting about this for our, our followers. <laughs> I've got um, a Snuggeroo jersey, a Close jersey, and a Pitlick jersey to give away. Oh, so we'll be we uh, got some Dickie Town athletes swag to get out there. So, you know, stay tuned on the socials for us. Make sure you're following Go for Puck Live, Pull Tap Sports on uh, Twitter, X, and Instagram. And then you can get a chance to win those. So, Brian, what does Penn State need to do this weekend to be successful in your point of view? You need to finish in the positives on special teams. Uh, mm. Penalty kill, power play, we're much better against Ohio State. Obviously, Minnesota is a different opponent than Ohio State is is this year. But I thought the power play to have five power play goals in a weekend against Ohio State, you know, it can be an equalizer. It had been it had been hurting Penn State the other it just couldn't get any momentum off of it even. Uh and giving up some shorthanded goals, especially against Michigan State, really hurt them. And then to get goaltending from Sulier. I mean last year he had a 919 save percentage postseason run. You know, he had 52 saves in a game at Ohio State. He was great in, in the regional, uh, great in the first round win, a shutout. And he was great against Michigan. Uh, I thought he really was a stabilizer. The team played really confident in front of him last year. And it just didn't have that same sense this year. The second game against Notre Dame, even though they lost three of the four goals against him were power play goals. And, and yeah, he didn't pitch a shutout against Ohio. The four three wins. But he made some spectacular saves in, in sequences, and they were timely. They just had they hadn't been getting timely saves all year. He's kind of split with Granin, won the job here finally. Going back to him, if they can get that goaltending and special teams, you know, five on five, I think they've not necessarily been at their identity all year. But I think they've been a pretty decent hockey team. Mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of those those margin error areas that they've been up and down. And if, if they can get that consistently to go along with how they've played, you know, five on five and give them 60 minutes, I think they got a decent chance here on the road. You know, I think they're still a, a real feisty group, um, probably a group that with their freshmen ha has gotten better offensively as the years gone on with the line of Fink, who, who's unbelievable and is putting great numbers up. He's with two other freshmen, Lawback and DeMarsico. Um, and then when they go, you know, to have success, Kerwin and Geneev need to have good weekends offensively for them. Uh, it's probably a team that, you know, you reflect back on the team. You're talking about the team that made all the runs and wins against Minnesota. Smirnoff and Pavlicev became third line guys. And that's a pretty darn good third line. I, I don't know that they have the depth this year scoring wise that they've had maybe on some of those really good teams in the past. But when the freshman line scoring, when Geneev scoring, Kerwin scoring, those other lines are still good, solid defense and, and identity lines. They're not pushovers. So if they can get the scoring from their top guys too, uh, that'll really help them. Viggs, I, I would like to see a, a little more from Mr. Snuggerud. He's been a little quiet since the CC, the big CC series with his four goals. Um, he's had some pretty good chances too. Uh, there's a couple times last week and he was left you know, in the last couple of weekends, he's been left alone out front and he hasn't been able to bury it. Yeah, and he hit that pipe on Saturday that could have sealed the game. You know, Suggerud's going to keep shooting. You know, that's kind of his thing. He's going to keep firing pucks on net. I think what needs to happen is he just has to get more of those pucks on net as opposed to some of the corner picking that he's doing. I think he's starting to get a little frustrated that they're not going in as easy. So he's really trying to pick those corners. And sometimes you just have to realize, you know, let's just try to beat them somewhere else. And, and that's something I'm looking for there. You know, I think, you know, Brian's right. that power play and special teams is going to be huge for this weekend. You know, I was looking at some of the numbers in college hockey and there's a lot of teams in that 20 to 25% conversion range on the power play. And when I was talking to coach Bosco, the start of the year he's like i'd really like this team to be closer to 30 
you know, we have so much talent on the power play that they have the potential to get to a 30% type power play if they really start humming and clicking and getting some chemistry. And I just, you know, they're not bad. You know, they're at 25%. They're like 10th in the nation in power play. But I almost feel like there's more there that they're not tapping into. And so I, I wonder if we're going to see that at the end of the year here with them or if this is just what we got. And they'll just have some chaos goals that they do and just those snipe chances that they convert on. Start with faceoffs, Viggs. Uh, I, you see it so many times. They lose that offensive zone power play faceoff. And they're chasing the puck back in their own end and starting over. Well, I think part of that is with that first unit, they're trying to get Oliver Moore that opportunity to, to play center yeah. on that group and develop that skill set for him. You know, we've often talked about it. Bob wants his players to develop and grow over the season. And, you know, this is the time of year where you got to start dialing it in and figuring out what you actually have as opposed to what you hope you have. And maybe if Oliver Moore isn't the guy who can win 55% of his draws, they might have to figure something else out. Um, Because I know Jackson Nelson has really been the only center for them that can dominate in the dot. And even he will have his off nights from, Mm -hmm. from weekend to weekend. You mentioned Oliver Moore. He's really picked up his game since World Juniors. Yeah, he's been great. He's figured out ways to use his speed, use his line mates, play more possession hockey. You know, even though that goal got waved off because he was on in the crease, he's in the right spot. You know, he's not viewed as a guy who's a net front guy, but every mm-hmm. once in a while you have to sacrifice for your line mates and take that mm-hmm. position out front. I'm sure that's something we'll see from Penn State all weekend is lots of traffic in front of Justin Close. And and that worries me a little bit for Minnesota because it's going to put guys like Oliver Moore in that defense first mode in their own zone where they're mm-hmm. going to have to battle in front of the net. And too often we see those guys puck watching instead of finding their check and finding sticks and showing their numbers to Justin Close. They're often watching Justin Close try to find the puck. Well, Brian, one thing I do like that Penn State has brought to this league is offense. Uh, I, I I love that this is not going to be a one nothing two to one games this weekend. I love the fans love the up and down play. Yeah, the coaches probably don't so much, but let's go. Let's have some fun this weekend. A little racehorse hockey would be great. Well, I think, and I think Guy thinks this. I think everyone in the program thinks this. The best defense is a great offense because that puck <laughs> isn't in your zone. And it, you know, it all starts with their defense. And I think Penn State's decor has got some really good puck movers. Uh, they want to get it out. One one pass now, like, and I think Palisic, who came in as a transfer from Dartmouth, twenty two, he's fun to watch. Uh, Jimmy Dowd Jr. is having a great year, number six. He can skate, he can move pucks, and then probably the most consistent guy all year has been number four, Simon Mack. Uh, real steady game. Uh, he's been fun. Dylan Gratton's had a really good sophomore year. I think those guys on the back end are really important to what they want to do offense. And when Penn State's clicking and hitting its passes and their D is moving the puck efficiently and effectively, that's when they're at their best, then setting those forwards up to go retrieve pucks, get shots, get bodies to the net, get those second, third opportunities. Um, and, and, you know, I really thought coming into the year, and I think the goals against for Penn State's more of a reflection of a, of a, a goaltender tandem that had at one point the worst safe percentage in the country. Um, I really thought that D core was one of the strengths of the team and still believe it to be a, a pretty decent group. You know, it, it's not, you know, it might not have the flashy names of a, of a Faber and Lacombe and a, a Johnson on it, but I think it's a pretty solid, solid group that they have, uh, the way that they can move pucks. Uh, so I think it starts with the, the speed that they play with and the tempo they play with starts with that group. And I think it's been a fun group for us to watch, watch all year long. All right, Viggs. Let's hear your predictions for the weekend. How many points does each team get? Well, I think this is going to be an important weekend for Minnesota to have that D zone structure. I think some of the weekends they've had, you know, the shots have come to the net, but there hasn't been that intense pressure looking for rebounds and second chances. And that's something that Penn State does really, really well. 
You know, they they create that chaos and they want to get teams out of their structure. And Minnesota hasn't consistently proven that they can handle that to me. I was looking at DraftKings.com for an over-under on this weekend, and it's six and a half. So they're looking for, you know, seven goals a, a night here out of this series. I think we're probably going to see that at least on Friday. And I just don't know if Minnesota is going to play consistent enough defensively to come away with two wins. So I'm thinking Gophers get four points. Penn State gets two. Probably getting that uh, extra point in a shootout. I just I just think it's going to happen. We're going to see you another shootout this happen? weekend. Yep, we're going to see another shootout probably on Saturday in front what? of my kids. In front of my kids. And uh, Penn State what? will win the two. Wow. That's a bold prediction. That's a, If that comes true, Viggs, <laughs> you're my hero. <laughs> well, what do you think, Brian? You know, that's kind of a split what Viggs is picking here. Well, how do you think it's all going to turn out? I can tell you, Penn State could really use at least one road win against, what, the top 10 team in a pairwise to try to climb back into that bubble. Yeah. I, you know where my paycheck comes from, right, if you're trying to ask for a prediction here? Hmm. <laughs> i think penn state played its best i think penn state's played played one of its best weekends of the year against ohio state sweeping them in a big 10 sweep at home I would love to see the goaltending special teams carry over and I, I think they match up look this is you know my take on minnesota i think you guys kind of touched on this in, in a roundabout way i think they've got a lot of talent like when you look at the teams in the league this year i think wisconsin maybe not the most talented team, but really buys into the system that they play with what Hastings has done with them. Uh, Michigan State kind of plays that same wide open style, probably a little bit more talented than Wisconsin. It seemed like they really buy into their system. Minnesota, I'm curious because it's been this way the last couple of years with Bob's teams. You know, As you guys have talked about, it's like figuring out who they are and what they want to be that mm-hmm. that you never really know what their identity like they don't really have that clear-cut identity uh but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing because they're so darn talented really curious to see how different they are from december 1 and 2 to february 9th and 10th um because i thought penn state you know they took it to them that first period of the first mm-hmm. game And Minnesota scored on their first two shots. And that was the end of the game because Penn State couldn't recover from how did you play such a great period and be trailing two to one after that first period. And the second night, Penn State was the better team. Um, Granted, it's at Pagula. It's a place that has haunted Minnesota over the years. You know, Mariucci is a different animal. Um, But I thought Penn State played incredibly, incredibly well in that series. And I thought they matched up fairly well against a really talented Minnesota team um, that's still deep, but without that top line to drive it, um, you know, like Jackson Nelson's like my favorite player in the league, 200 foot guy to see had one power play goal this year. I'm like what's going on there? Um, yeah. I'm curious. I'm really curious. I don't have a prediction, but I'm curious. I, I personally, I'm still not sold Viggs. I know you're trying to, thinking this team has figured it out. I don't think they've figured it out yet. I hope they do, but I still see a, a split type of a weekend, you know, like a lose Friday night, win Saturday night convincingly. It's like, that's kind of what's happened most of the season this year, Biggs. As Bob said, they've been very consistent at playing well one night. Consistently inconsistent. <laughs> yeah, playing well one night and not well the next. And Brian, thanks for correcting me on how last series went. I think I had it flipped around as I thought back to my December brain. But yeah, one game they've been good. One game they've been off. And uh, that's definitely been the trend for them. We'll have to wait and see. Like I said, what what are you thinking, Jupe? What are you thinking? Uh, I think it's going to be split. Three three points apiece. Yeah, I just prove it to me. They can't seem to put it together. I'm like, it's, oh, we play we play five out of six periods. We played one good game. We played one bad game. I, I still need it kind of proven to me, Biggs. Yeah. I just think that the style of play that they've played the last two weekends, they essentially have played 11 good periods out of 12. They have been playing very consistent hockey. And I always tell like my youth hockey players – 
don't let the results dictate how you perceive your performance. If you're playing well for 11 out of 12 periods, things are going pretty well. And and you have to trust that that's going to carry you forward into the games in the future and stick to that formula. Don't try to do things that aren't part of your game plan. And that's what happened in the one period where they didn't play well against Michigan State. They were chasing offense. And the interesting thing about that is when Bob criticized it, he didn't criticize them for trying to score. He criticized them for not coming back on the back check. He's okay with them taking some chances. But you better believe if you're not given your full effort to come back and recover after taking that chance, that's what he's going to get on you about. And that's what Minnesota hockey is. Take chances, but come back and play hard defense. Yeah, I think you look at the results, and I didn't see both Michigan State games, saw how they went, obviously, to be, you know, dominate the first two periods of the first game and lose it at the end. Uh, then to win on the road, and I thought they were rolling. Uh, and then what they did, I know they didn't really score a ton last weekend, but to do that at Wisconsin, those crowds, they're playing some pretty good hockey. Like, just just the, those results themselves speak volumes. Because after we saw Wisconsin and Michigan State, and I'm not saying Penn State played well those weekends, I thought those two teams are legitimate national championship contenders. And to do it on the road... As, I'm very curious. That's what I said. I'm really curious to see where Minnesota's at mm-hmm. and back at home against you know a Penn State team that that's trying to get on track and seems like it may have and has always given them trouble. Really curious how it plays out more than like I think it's hard to get a gauge on exactly what's going to happen. Well, it's going to be a fun weekend. It sounds like we're going to have some great crowds, which is what I'm looking forward to. I actually like the early Saturday game, Viggs. Like you said, a lot of youth. A lot of kids going to be there. It's sold out more than a week in advance, so over ten thousand tickets sold. So that's going to be fun. Uh, so I'm definitely I'm looking forward to just getting back to Mary You have you know traveling and so many road stuff. I haven't been there in a while, so it's going to be fun to be back there this weekend. But Brian, thanks for coming on our show, first time participant. No problem. A- anytime, you know. I'm more than happy. Well, now to come you're back. a Penn State guy, so now we're gonna have to have you on every time, every weekend, that, the week they play Penn State. I'll have to get some new material for next time, uh, but also <laughs> like the early Saturday start, we're like we'll be home by ten o'clock. Like, mm-hmm. but it probably just probably just jinxed a huge flight delay, but nah, <laughs> we'll be you're home. good. I like it too. <laughs> but thanks for being on the show, Viggs. Are you working on anything right now? You'll see something from me soon. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Is is it GPO or is it us show? We got two things at once. Oh, my goodness. We got two things at once. There you go. Get get ready. Yep. I like hearing that. I like hearing that. Well, that's going to do it for the GPL podcast. Of course, we got to thank Brian for coming on the show this week, and we'll definitely have him back. Uh, For those of you watching live, stay tuned for some overtime. For the rest of you, we'll catch you next week on the GPL podcast. All right, Vig, show us. These are a little bit of a mess around here. I got uh, something from Drecker called The Nightman Cometh. It's got kind of like a Nittany Lion type logo. I guess that's the Nightman for this one. So it's a bourbon barrel aged Russian Imperial Stout uh, from Drecker. Our friends up in uh, the Fargo area there. So I was looking for a percentage on here, but. Let's see the pour. Let's see the pour here. Here we go. Ooh, it's another dark one. That's really another dark, dark one. Well, it's the nightman cometh. It's got to be dark. Nice. There you go. So, all right. Let's know how does it taste. Give it a taste. This is great. I don't know if I can say I love all the hazy stuff coming out, Drucker, but they do this one really, really well. I love it. So, very Here's- nice. So I love how Cappy was chiming in there during the show.
<laughs> All time great guy right there. Yeah, Cappy's been a great addition. I, I think he's been on with us 12 or 13 times, something like that. He's kind of our go to guy now. You know, we're either Big Ten or, well, Ohio State. We, we always have to have him when they play Ohio State. Unfortunately, his Ohio State team is good against everybody except for teams in the Big Ten this year. Oh, okay. What do we got here? We got some comments. Oh, it's a gentle giant thinks that looks tasty. That's great. Brian, now that we're all friends here in overtime, what's the deal with shot tallies at Pagula? <laughs> if you look at Penn State's home road splits, they don't change that. Like, I know you Minnesota know, people talk about this all the time, but they their home road splits are not different. So that's my defense of it. Here's, I think it's better now. Four or five years ago and before that, it wasn't. It was so bad at times. You know, I know our friend uh, Nate, Gopher State, uh, actually attended some of those games. He goes, he, he would be at some at Penn State. He's like, that shot was well wide, and they counted it. In fact, I even know that one stats guy from Minnesota watched on TV and did his best chance, his best tracking of shots for the team so he could give it to the team. So it, it, it used to be more – I don't think it's as bad as it used to be, but it used to be a little more off. I think they've had a little better training on what's a shot. But their shot average has always been about 39 to 40. So so it's not like their shot average has changed mm. over the years. But I, I, really, I, hey, I like like I've heard it. It's how they play. And it honestly, if it was that much different home and road, I'd buy into the, I'd buy into the conspiracy. But I, I honestly – I honestly well, plus don't. we just like that fun. I, I think it makes too. for a great. I think it makes for a great topic. I know it makes Gopher <laughs> fans mad, so I think they should ramp uh, it up even more next time. <laughs> See, this is the kind of banter we need in the college yes. the world of just embracing, <laughs> embracing the conflict. Yeah, Penn State has had the same, the same guy do stats for the last seven years now. Guy, the, there, or is it, there's just one person. I hope there's more than one. The one, well, calling the shots, like okay. there's someone. So they they have someone who inputs, but someone yells, you know, shot wide, shot save. There were first two years someone, the next two years someone, and then the last seven years it's been consistent. Now, the guy the last seven years has done an unbelievable. He, he's good to work with. He's done a good job. He's got a lot of shots to keep up with. A lot of shot attempts. Yeah. A lot of shot attempts. Viggs, is, uh, was, the, was the beer of the week sponsored by Rob Shield this week, or is this a different one? This one is not. It's not. Yeah. And Rob yeah. Shield is actually the official scorer for Gopher Hockey. <laughs> he, has, he has donated some beers. I thought this might be a week. You know, I, I don't want to get him involved with this show. So, you know. <laughs> Brian, you're gonna have to watch yourself with these stat guys when you come into the rink because they're gonna <laughs> they all a bunch of them watch this, so they they'll probably. Well, have some I think Rob's gonna you. miss the Friday game. He'll be at the Saturday game. He's not gonna be at the Friday okay. game. He's got some high school, some girls' high school hockey with his kids. So, so Brian, do you get to uh, see a lot of Penn State practice? Do you, do you hang around the rink and take that in and and yeah, learn I probably go two got? two three two three days a week. Try to stop on by uh, when possible. I heard Guy kind of talk about how he's kind of changing his philosophy a little bit with how much chaos and how much structure he puts into his team. Have you noticed that at all with watching him as close as you do? I think when Giuliano Pagliaro came in as an assistant, he's now associate head coach, uh, with his background in goaltending and and defense, um, you know, I think Guy has acknowledged and admitted that they did tweak some things. Um, so I think this is this is year three for Pags here. So, you know, I, I think they still want that same identity, the same purpose, tenacity. Um, but, but yeah, he, he's talked about a couple of things that maybe they've tweaked over the last couple of years. So I've noticed a little bit, like, they're a little less aggressive for checking. Uh, Don Lucia's 
uh, favorite thing was if you're late for the dance, just wait for the dance to come to you. <laughs> so if, if you're not going to apply pressure on the four track, just wait for them. They'll, they'll come to you. So I've, I've noticed that a little bit with Penn state as I've watched them this year, as they do that a little bit more often as before, it was just like chaos. It was just like send guys recklessly <laughs> after the puck and, and try to create that chance. And I think it's adapting to the personnel that, that you have. Like in, in the beginning, you know, I'm not sure they were recruiting the types of the same talent of players that they've been able to attract the last couple of years. And I think there's still that goal of, you know, a, attracting some kids. Uh, Aiden Fink seems like he, he might have a, a chance to really go and, and be something, but you're still trying to attract you know, Pittsburgh so big right now. And, and as you guys know, Cooley coming out of there, but um this is that era where the kids who grew up watching Crosby and Malkin, uh, they're, they're college age student athletes right mm -hmm. now. Um, and I think Penn state's done a really good job. You know, Barrett obviously was probably one of the top ones that they've, they've gotten here. Holtz was, was a big time player was committed to Wisconsin. Uh, Fink was committed to Wisconsin and, and ended up here. Yeah. You know, Limoges was kind of like slept on and, and became mm -hmm. a big time guy. Folks fit the system they play. Uh, Susie, Spyro, they, they, they've gotten some, some really good kids through the years, but I, I still think they haven't cracked necessarily that top where they're getting the same national team development program kids that Michigan State, Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin maybe have been able to attract, uh, which speaks, I think, to their coaching and what they've been able to do with the system they play, the style they play, development of those players and identifying players who might not come from those same programs that that some of those other talented players have come from. Like they found a player that fits their identity, fits how they want to play, fits their style. Um, maybe sometimes a little bit older. And look, if you're 23 and you're going against an 18 year old, uh, I'm not going to say 17 because Celebrini is on an unreal level. And the slap shot one timer he had the other night in the bean pot was like ridiculous. Um, but they've attracted players and have, have a real good idea of who fits what they want to do. Um, so I think it's kind of marrying that with, with the skill thing. And also when you're changing the, the players or, you, you know, who you're attracting, that may impact what you want to do systematically or schematically, I think, I think as well. Got a question here from Ryan. Has PSU development or developed any good rivalries with any schools in particular in the Big Ten or outside of the conference? I think a lot of the rivalries for Penn State started just being the natural Big Ten rivalries. Like when you're mm -hmm. a football blue blood like Penn State is, uh, immediately anytime Ohio State steps on this campus or Michigan steps on this campus, uh, there's that immediate hatred. <laughs> like, yeah. like that, that immediately is going to happen. I think because of the way the Penn State-Minnesota hockey games went over the first decade of the Big Ten, I think that developed into a great rivalry. I, I'm not sure if it carried over to the fan base at Minnesota as much as it did here, um, but I, I thought that was a great on-ice rivalry. I think the success Ohio State had and the way they play, like one year Dakota Joshua came here, Ohio State got a sweep, they threw a broom on the ice. Um, I, I thought that led to some really good on-ice moments. Uh, I don't know that it's there yet with with Michigan State, but still, like, like being a football blue blood and this is no knock on Minnesota, but it's just when you're mm -hmm. playing Michigan State, Ohio State, Michigan in any sport, it doesn't matter. That immediately is a rivalry game. And that's what it is for Penn State. Outside of the Big Ten, you know, they've played Robert Morris, Mercy Hurst, kind of those those local teams. Uh, I think because Denver was a team to knock them out twice, uh, that, that was viewed as oh, we got Denver as kind of like the team to get them. Um, but you haven't had that rival. Um, and I should add Notre Dame for rivals. You know, and again, that probably dates back to the football thing, right? Mm -hmm. Notre Dame, Penn State football is going to carry over into hockey. Carl, Andrew Carlson, the players clearly feel the rivalry. Neither Cooley had a blast taunting the fans there last season. <laughs> and the fans probably gave it right back to them oh, at first. That's probably why I they did it. I love that. <laughs> you, know, you know, you mentioned you mentioned the broom thing. Years ago, probably it's almost almost twenty years ago now. I don't know if you were at that Duluth that weekend, Vs when Eric Westrom. <laughs> well, Minnesota got swept in Duluth, and literally a hundred brooms came flying onto the ice from the stands. And did you know Eric Westrom tried to throw one back? At I the thought it was section? Ballard who did that. 
I think it's Eric Westrom. No, I think it was Ballard. We'll Eric see Westrom. What the fans, see what the fans remember in the chat because I thought it was, it was no, it wasn't. I thought it might have been Ballard. Eric Westrom, Westrom. who is a, a famous Gopher hockey player from Apple Valley, who is now coaching high school hockey, and his behavior recently got him a three-game suspension for conduct unbecoming of a head coach. Really? <laughs> yes. Who's he He's, coaching? He, uh, it's escaping me at the moment, but it was the game against Edina. I think it was. Well, Edina, Edina can bring that out in a lot of people. Yep. <laughs> okay, folks, who was in Duluth back in 2004, maybe? Which which player threw, threw tried to throw a broom back up over the edge? That was that was quite the interesting weekend, though, Brian. I remember being there, and it was at the old deck, and all of a sudden, just this these brooms just come. Fly. I don't know how these kids snuck them in. They probably just let them take it in, but full <laughs> full on, you know, five foot brooms flying. out. Visiting of brooms are not allowed. Home brooms usually are okay. Oh, <laughs> they just, they're just trying to help clean up their own rink after the game, right? I mean, yeah, he's coaching do. Holy Family. So. Holy Family. Okay, so. Oops. He's remember being Ballard, but it could have been a dream. Maybe, I mean, maybe it could have been both. Maybe Ballard well, could have done one year and Western did another yeah, year. Western was gone because this was after the titles, and Western was a late nineties guy. Okay, we've got so many memories over here, Brian. Yeah, we we need to get to Penn State though. But what's the chance of getting? You know, we could probably only go with media leagues. I don't know if we could get in there as a fan because getting a ticket is is difficult. Yeah, what's the it's, the ticket like there, Brian? Yeah, I, I think there's – look, every game is officially a sellout, but there's also a secondary market. Um, yeah. Some games – yeah, that secondary market is hot. Like, like if Minnesota's here for a wear-white game, anytime Minnesota's here, I think the secondary market is high, but it's not like otherworldly. I, I would say 30 to 50 bucks get in. Yeah. Um, reasonable now now like if it is a, a sports weekend and there's basketball and maybe wrestling at home too and there's a lot of people coming into town yeah you you may be in the 100 200 range um just myers always comes with a credential but... jube likes to go as, on a uh, room trip on some of these road trips as well i i still like to go to at least one game a year as a fan yeah. you you just would love me. it I mean, uh, it is, I, yes. it, it is, it is the right size when they did it, it yeah. is the right size. So if there's a non-conference Thursday night game ahead of a football weekend against Canisius and yeah, it may be announced as 5,800 in the building, but there's 3,800 in the building. You don't know. Like, like there's always going to be, the student section is always going to be a majority of it filled and it's bleachers. So if it's not you know, 900 students there that night and there's 700 students there, 600 students still looks full. Um, and, and, you know, you get the low tin roof. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, the concourse isn't open. So if you're on the lower level, you can't see through, it traps the noise. It is, it is a great, it is a great place. Are you listening, watch, Ohio State? Game. Are you listening, Ohio State? Please. If they listen. if they ever got anything, if they ever got anything like it with what what they've accomplished for Steve Rollick playing in that, you know, it. I mean, let's be frank. It is a morgue. I mean, it is a morgue. What what they've accomplished and their practice situation, everything is honestly unbelievable. Our fingers are crossed. Well, well, I was saying women's hockey too. Like oh, the women's hockey, the is. dean has just built a juggernaut over there. Like they came here to play the Gophers two weeks, ago, three weeks ago, and won like fifteen to one over the weekend or something like that. It's just ridiculous. Like she's done you know, such I a did, good job there. The Westwood one, we did the women's Frozen Four one year when they hosted it here at Penn State. Um, so we're going through. I did with Kendall Coins Gofield, and we're doing pre-production meetings, and Nadine walks into the room. And what like a presence she has <laughs> about her. She is like she could coach any level, any gender. Like she's a little scary when she comes in the room, <laughs> but, but she's like she she draws an immediate respect. Um, 
really, really impressed with what they've done. And it's on her clock. Like th those production meetings, it, it, if it started at 1145, but they had another 10 minutes of film to watch, they're watching that film, that film first. Um, yeah, she, what, what they did with that rink that they play in oh, for women's gosh. hockey and what she's That's accomplished cool. there. And right, it is a different era with with NIL and all that other stuff. Like, like yeah. I'm sure that plays it plays a factor. But what she's done there is is really phenomenal. But Vigo and I played adult league D league in better arenas than they did, or they do still. Yeah, it's it's, it's and like I said, they do want to build a new women's facility. And and like Vigo and I've been talking about, if they could just bump it up a little bit and make it. A pagula sized arena. Perfect for and Ohio State has some hockey players. guys in place now that hopefully see the vision of let's do this once and do it right. Mm -hmm. And and get both our programs in good spots for the next fifty years. You just have to hope they have that perspective and get it done. Because Ohio State's got plenty of money and they can't put it all towards their NIL. You know, they got to spend it first. Then they can redirect the donations to their NIL group. We'll just have to wait and see. I, and, you know, you think some of the phase two changes here of Mariucci Vigs, they might be removing seats as well to have more high-end, like, you know, areas. I mean, they have the one little area down below the ice. The ice they've got the, the suites, but they... They want to make some adjustments too, and maybe not be such a big ten thousand five hundred seat place. Yeah, I mean they've talked about having some areas that are kind of more like lodge seating, like with couches and special mm -hmm. drink and beverage service areas or high tops for people to gather and socialize during the games. Because I've always told people it's like winning is not a sales strategy for tickets. You know, you have to create atmosphere and experience and 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 sell that because you, you're not going to go to the frozen four every year <laughs> and so you have to create that experience of the rink that people just want to come and gather and spend time um and i think that's where we're going with a lot of athletics right now and that's that next phase you know you look at all the facilities here in the twin cities the university of minnesota is struggling with their basketball and hockey <laughs> facilities to compete and it's just something they have to do I, think I agree with this, State, Denny. Bench seats for the students. Yep. It 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 makes the student section here, you know, and it was a huge like running joke as they built it, but it is as steep as code would allow. So they're they're just it's bench seating. They stand on the benches the whole game, and they're just so engaged in the one end. Um, and I think like Mariucci, when you're there for a big game, we were there for the Big Ten semifinals and to watch the Michigan and the Gopher games uh, in the Big Ten tournament. Like, like that student section rocks, but it just doesn't have that that intimidating feel. You know, even that Yost has where the students are on top of you on the bench seating. Penn State has because the, the way they're structured. Um, they're not on the, the glass. Environment, That's why. They're not. They're, they're the not on the glass. The environment at Penn State is like a football game inside the hockey rink. And I think, you know, no matter – and the team plays such an entertaining brand. Like who, who doesn't want to come watch a game that could end 7-5? to five? Um and I think like part of what and guys talked about this when he started the program, knowing how to build it was to play an entertaining brand of hockey. And yeah, he's played entertaining brands at Alaska and Princeton, but like that's part of what he wanted to do to attract fans and the attention on the program was to play that style. Like, I don't think they would have had the same success in building the program, the fan support that they've had. 11 years later, if they played Notre Dame style, <laughs> like, oh, no. I, I just don't, I just don't believe it. People want to come be a part of the environment and see the type of hockey they play. Even if it's a team that may not be a tournament or frozen for potential team. Um, like they've had a couple of them, but even if it's not that caliber, people want to come and see it and be a part of the environment and the way they play is so attractive to fans and you're hoping to prospective players like like who wouldn't want to play in an offense where you could be a guy that could put up a 50 point season careful brian jeff jackson's gonna come after you he's, <laughs> he's been making the rounds this year going after people he's like we don't play that defensive style 
Like, <laughs> they, they, says, they have, do. They, you know, and I think it was at the last Frozen Four they were in. It, it was a point, like, they did open it up a little, but until they get a one nothing lead, then they go back to being... Then they close it up again. Yeah, that's like, okay, yeah, that's enough. Let's pull back I've our always... Four well, no, I was just going to say, Beeks, that I've always thought that it would be so much better for Minnesota if the students were on the glass. Yeah, The fact that there's a walkway in front of the entire student section, uh, yes, they're loud. I, I, I wear earbuds down there because all that sound comes right off the glass and hits you right near it, so it's it's very loud, but not for the guys on the ice as, as much. I'm waiting for there to be a hockey rink that does like the safe stand seating like they have at Allianz Field where they've got the Wonder Wall. I don't know if you're a soccer fan, Brian, but the MLS stadium here, Allianz, their supporter section is just standing room with mm-hmm. bars to make sure they don't have like people get trampled. This is popular in Europe for soccer teams out there. And so they built that Wonder Wall. And it's just a wall of fans as close to the field as you can, as steep as you can. And they stand and chant and cheer the whole game. And I really think that's a good way to have a student section for whoever. We should talk to Tom Betty from uh, JLG, who does a lot of rink design, and be like, has anyone ever thought about doing that at a hockey rink? Because I think you're right, that's Brian. If you can get those anyway. students right up, it, it, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, the, best, anyway. the best two student sections in the Big Ten are, are Penn State, and I know I'm biased, but Penn State and Michigan. And, and the proximity has a lot to do with that. Like, I remember going to, to Madison the first couple of years, and they had Cordelis and Zangerly, and they had some really good teams. Um, and when that thing's full, like, they're loud, they're intimidating, they're also on the glass. Um, Minnesota, as you said, it is it is loud. Like, I, our players have talked about how loud it gets inside. I know you said maybe not on this. They've talked about how... With 10,000 people, if it's a big game, big crowd, they've talked about how loud it can get yeah. in there. It, it's just, again, proximity and what they're yelling, what those signs are. If you're 10 rows up, you're not seeing that sign. But if they're in the front row like they are at Yoast and have the sign on the glass right behind your bench, it, it's it's a little bit different of an animal. I love the Humpty Dumpty one that's been happened to Moscow a few times. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Carl Thanks. Fish was talking about that today. He's just like, yep, we see those signs. They're entertaining. Good job, everyone. Keep it up. It makes it fun. But he's just like, <laughs> I, I. he loves playing the villain, and he loves going to buildings that are full. Brian, if uh, the NCAA regional campus site discussions hit Penn State with as much fervor as they've hit the GPL podcast? Uh, maybe not yet this year based on just – the success I think that Penn State has had as a regional host. Uh, you know, they hosted in Allentown, which is about two hours, 45 minutes from campus here. Um, but it's 90 minutes west of New York and 90 minutes, if that, north of Philly. Uh, actually, I grew up there, Lehigh Valley, and Penn State sold it out. So, you know, I, I don't know that it's resonated as much with this. Like, if you're hosting the regional and you're playing in it, and you're selling out your arena as they were last year. It was it was a huge. It was like a, it was another home game for them. Um, the first time Penn State made a regional, it was in Cincinnati, and you know Penn State had a nice section there, but there was a circus the week before, and it still smelled like the circus oh, in the God. bowels of the in the bowels oh, of the arena. Um, I am pro having it. I think what makes college hockey great is the students, the fans. I, I think having it on campus is is ultimately the way to go. But but has the discussion gotten here maybe as close as it has other places? Uh, no. Uh, part of that might be with Penn State kind of outside the bubble right now. And then another part of that is the success they've had as a host. I was just trying to think what the other game was for that regional. Was it last year? Didn't Cappy get sent there? I think Cappy did get sent there. It was Michigan was... and Colgate was the other game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Did Cappy you... was sent there with uh... – Do you remember what that game was like at all for attendance? Yeah, it was still pretty good. Um, it was actually the second game. So we thought, you know, you put Penn State second. 
uh, like we always anticipate being the night game. Mm-hmm. And that way people are going to file in, you know, have their beverages for the game, you know, watch you're at least get to watch second and third. Period. But a lot of people after Penn state won, a lot of people stuck around either to root against Michigan or at least see part of who they may play. The atmosphere at the beginning of that game was pretty good. And Michigan's the same way. Like, I think anytime you put Penn State and Michigan anywhere, people are going to come, probably like in North Dakota, Minnesota. Uh, but especially in the Lehigh Valley, like Michigan's alumni network in New York City is huge. Um, so to be like in a area in the mid-Atlantic that's a great proximity to places, that was a good good host site. Like Cincinnati is not a great host city. There's there's nothing with college hockey there. Uh, it's far from everywhere. Who we were there. Denver was there. Michigan Tech was there. Like I think it depends on the teams in the locations. Is Loveland, Colorado great? If Denver's not playing, probably not. Um, it, Maryland it's, Heights. It's how they choose it and proximity and some of the state of some of these rinks. Um, yeah, but it's it's, it's I, not great. So that's why I, re- I, I support on campus, one hundred percent. Yeah, I just think when we start cherry picking regionals that work well because a team gets placed close to home and has that home home site support. Yeah, if you're a four seed going against the one seed, works, I I just think you know David Carl did a great job explaining this to Adam Odon. He's like, why are we bending over backwards to like? cherish the success of attendance when someone gets a regional and then makes the tournament and then wins and gets to the next round of the tournament so that they have fans at both games. I think when that's your positive outcome, that's not great for college hockey. If you could have it in Nashville for a regional and you'd sell out the building and there's no local team and people just want to go to Nashville and watch college hockey, that would be a sign it's working. If you want to send the games to, you know, Anaheim and you sell out a regional, regardless of who's playing, that's a sign that it's working. When you have to like cherry pick these good examples, like even here, we had St. Cloud be the one seed at a regional at Excel, and the games were terrible for attendance. You know, that's a local team that should win and fill up at least the lower bowl. And I think they were getting like six, 7,000 fans for those games and like 2,000 for the game that St. Cloud wasn't playing in. It's just a tough sell for me. And in those the, fun. <laughs> when you talk about competitive balance and competitive spirit too, is it really fair to be rooting for Providence, you know, as an example, to sneak in as a four seed just because they're going to host in Providence and being a four seed, having that home ice against the one seed, like is that truly what we're what we want to achieve and take away from a team to earn a number one seed's unbelievably difficult, and they should have they should have a competitive advantage, and putting them on home ice is a competitive advantage of that. Well, and Providence is a regional this year, but mm-hmm. Providence isn't the host. So theoretically, if they yep. get in as a three or four seed, and they're probably still going to get placed in Providence to help attendance, that makes no <laughs> sense at all to me. But at the same Pens- time, excluding them from playing there because they're not a one or two seed doesn't make sense either. Because then, how do you get teams to bid for regionals? It's yeah, yeah. You don't have bids for regionals. You just go to the home rink. <laughs> Problem solved. Problem we're solved. Bidding. Should be great. So we're trying to keep that conversation going here at least. And with every person we get on, we just want to get different perspectives. Because it it can work if a team makes the NCAA tournament and they have strong support. And I know Penn State staffed that regional very, very well. You know, it's a P5 institution with lots of staff that can make it a great event it would be even better if they just had it for their home game. Yeah. I, and and I, I don't I'm think scared sending... of Maryland Heights, dude, I'm scared of Maryland Heights <laughs> and Lindenwood hosting that. I, I don't think sending four teams to a number one seed is the right thing either, but you have that extra week in there. Everyone, you know, NCA is chartering, like find the money. 
if it's a Thursday, Sunday, a Thursday, Saturday, and you, you fly, one team has to fly somewhere one weekend, or you just use that extra weekend. It's one game. It, you know, you have to make last minute arrangements, or you add an extra weekend in there, wherever it is. I, I think, I think that's the way to go. And you know, I, I don't know that sending four schools to a number one seed site is also necessarily the solution. Well, well beings, you know, we've even talked about. We have all this time off in December where other sports like basketball doesn't have that big time off. We could still have the two week break between, you know, you know, those final games to go to the Frozen Four if you just play more games in December, but play one more weekend in December. Well, and I I think we're really- also I don't think this is gonna be talked about this off season, but I think in future off seasons. Why is the college schedule so condensed to these 36 games? Um, just thinking off the top of my head, I think Major Junior plays like 60 games. USHL, they play a well over 60 games. Why are we only playing 36 in college? So I think I, we might see condensed games and we might see you know teams where they might play three games a week or something like that too. I think with the emphasis on student athlete health, welfare, balance of academics, mental health, I, I, I don't think you'll expand beyond the 34 plus your conference tournament game. So, yeah, guaranteed 30. I, I, I don't think – I think the season's long enough. Like, like to go from October to, to April, you know, everyone always says, you guys start when? Yeah. Like, you, you start well, – yeah. I don't, I don't think the season needs to be longer. But I think you could probably fit in a few more games somehow. So don't take three weeks off in December. Yeah. If they don't take three weeks off, you know, you've got time for some extra games and you still have a week off for exams. So something I think might be coming down the pipeline for a later discussion. Because I know that when I listen to all these arguments about pairwise, you know, some schools claim it's like, well, we can't play enough games to really evaluate who's deserving certain seeds more than others. If you play a couple extra games, a couple extra non-conference games, maybe that helps solve that. I don't know. Because I think college hockey is a great product, and it's going to be competing with things here. So, Well, I think that's kind of your key right there, Viggs. You know, you want to celebrate the product, and you have an NCAA regional when – you know, a regional finals being played on the East Coast with two Western teams in front of 1,500 people. And it's on ESPN, the Ocho, or whatever. And some kid sees this and, like, I thought this college hockey thing was crazy. And then they see nobody. That's kind of what Schlossman was talking about in his article. You're not growing the game if, you, if you know, some Canadian kid who's interested in college hockey looks at the playoffs and says, well, that looks kind of boring and diseased. Yeah, Brian, what what is kind of the typical recruit for Penn State? I mean, they they are pretty national. It's all over. A lot of junior kids. I don't know how many Canadian kids they get. You know, the Michigan schools tend to dip into Ontario quite a bit. Denver looks in the BCHL. So does North Dakota. Have you kind of identified what their kind of pipeline is? Yeah, I think. You know, unlike a Minnesota that's recruiting all Minnesota kids, Wisconsin's kind of Minnesota, Wisconsin. Um, your your BCs, BUs, they're they're making sure all the best players from New England stay at home. Uh, Penn State, if a, a really talented player is in the state, the goal is to get him and keep him. Um, you know, they've had some success in Philly. Uh, usually, three four kids from Philly a year on the team three, four kids a year from Pittsburgh. I, I think Pittsburgh, you know, it's always produced good players, and Ohio State's done a really good job of Pittsburgh too, uh, RJ Umbrugger. Um, But you look at Pittsburgh, and I talked about it earlier, with the growth of their Penguins elite um, and the kids who have grown up with Crosby, Malk, and the Penguins and all the success they had. Like, they did a really good job of building youth hockey. And then if you're from Pittsburgh, you play hockey. Like, a lot of a lot of people at Penn State, you know, they come to Penn State, which is in the middle of nowhere, from Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. And if everyone that I know that 
is a, a student or was a student. I went to school here. Anyone from Pittsburgh, they all played hockey growing up for the most part. So, so that is a hockey area. So, so Penn State right now has really focused on that. But then across the country, you know, USHL, not, it doesn't matter what your home state is or where you are from. Uh, Limoges was from Virginia, so that's like a great, hey, if there's a good kid from the DMV area, we're, we're going to get him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it's been national. And then the success they've had in Canada is Toronto, Mississauga. They've had some, some good kids come out of there. Um, if, if you can get a kid like a Holtz from Wisconsin, that, that's awesome. Um, but they've done a good job. And Andrew Sturtz was a part of this, and he's now here as an assistant coach. And, mm-hmm. you know, Byro, they've got it. And I think Guy's connection helps. <laughs> but to like Sherwood Park and AJHL and going back up to Calgary, and they've done well there. Um, and then they've done pretty well, and they've gotten some good kids out of the BCHL. So, so they, they really are a national and international. You know, this year they don't have the international flavor that maybe they had with the audios. Um, in the past, Eric and Oscar, Smirnov, Pavlichev, you know, but their connection being Russian was that they played in Wilkes-Barre, Scranton with the junior Penguins team or the Knights, the Knights team there. So they kind of had a Pennsylvania connection already. Mm-hmm. It was them and Provorov were on the same team. And, and you know, Penn State wanted Provorov, but but I think he had, he had a little higher expectations. <laughs> He's going right to that. He's going right to the show. Um, so, yeah, it, it's keep the best kids here. Recruit nationally. You know, if there's a kid maybe who doesn't want to stay at home and play for Minnesota, play for Wisconsin, stay at home in New England, try to get them. Um, but USHL, Alberta, and BC. Who was it that left Minnesota? Was it Brinkman? Brinkman went to Notre Dame, right? Yeah, Brinkman's at Notre Dame. Stoddicker's at Northeastern. But do I, oh, who, we have his who, Lampa who, from Minnesota right now for us. Who was there previously? Gosh. Clayton Phillips? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they, they did him he was dirty. The, yeah, he was the one who was brought in early. They brought him in mid-season because he to was try to fix some people. things. That's right. Because that was the group that really struggled at Penn State <laughs> defensively. <laughs> and uh, it's funny. I was talking with a coach uh, this week about recruiting, and he's just like, you know, you usually don't want to bring guys to college to find their confidence if they're struggling to find it somewhere else. He's like, because once you get to college, it's not an easy game. You know, the age of player, the experience, the systems, the structure, the competition, it's not a place to find your game. It's a place to have your game going for you and humming and expand on it. Hmm. Yeah, I think with Minnesota recruiting, like you're starting to see Minnesota just go national. Like they're still always going to go after kids in Minnesota, you know, target the top talent. But you're starting to see Bob start to go, okay, I'm going to grab Matthew Nyes from Arizona. I'm going to grab Logan Cooley from Pittsburgh, from Notre Dame and Penn State. You know, I'm going to get LJ Mooney. Um, He dipped his toes into Iserman out east and he decided afterwards to go back home. But I think you're going to keep seeing Bob reach all over. And he's got some kids from Mount St. Charles come in. And uh, they're looking all over. A lot of good hockey players in America. I think college hockey could easily support another six to eight teams right now. Just with the growth <laughs> of the ten. game. Big 10, wake up. Well, I think we're coming somewhere with uh, realignment. You know, are we going to see a Summit League? Someone's got to take all these new teams like Lindenwood and LIU and Augustana or, you know, Stonehill, CCHA, yeah, Stonehill, CCHA is doing their part and CHC is taking St. Thomas, you know, or whatever. Um, it's going to happen, but come on, UCLA says Mr. Carlson. <laughs> it's expensive though. Like hockey's an oh, expensive yeah. sport, scholarships, gear, rink, travel. It, it, like what, how Arizona state has made it happen and being an independent for a while and eventually joining here but it's travel like how how the alaska schools were somehow able to to get funding to come back is pretty remarkable huntsville same thing it it is so far well penn state set the model (laughs) it's get a hundred million dollars build a (laughs) build a great rank put all the infrastructure endowed endow it 
you know, Arizona State couldn't quite do that. And you're seeing other schools kind of bootstrap it up differently. But, like, the Penn State model is what Illinois and Northwestern should be able to do. You know, that's that's who they should be targeting to, to figure that out. And just like Ryan's saying, you know, USC, UCLA, Oregon, you know, they could do the same thing. There's donors out there who could do it if they wanted to. You know, Will Arnett could probably sponsor USC and UCLA <laughs> if you want hockey in the <laughs> in Southern California. You know, Phil Knight easily could do Oregon if he wanted to and set them up for success. And I think, you know, having these campus sites for the tournament would only help. Oh, God. Because hockey is a ticket sale, self-sustaining model once you get it going, you know. You know, it costs probably $3 million a year to run a hockey program effectively. You know, maybe four in the Big Ten with all the travel. But it's sustainable. With with attendance, parking, concessions, suites, season tickets, Penn State has been – now, you know, basketball, you're making money because TV contract. Um, but Penn State hockey has been in the black. It's not it, you're not getting rich, but being endowed and having your arena, they're in the black. It's not by it a ton, always, sir. The it black. is always harder to prove that for me because that Penn State, uh, Pennsylvania records law that they have, so everything's a little more hidden over there. But, <laughs> but I'll believe you, Brian. Mister, Mister, I get the records from all the public universities, and I've been known to do a Freedom of Information Act request from time to time. So. Penn State usually turns me down. <laughs> they don't have to. So you're going after the money, Beaks. You're going after the money. Where is it going? What are they making? Well, the U the U released their uh, finances this uh, month, and they extended Mark Coyle to uh, another two years here at Minnesota. So things are looking good in the Big Ten. It's good to be in the Big Ten or the SEC right now in college athletics. I mean, there was a time, Brian, in the two, mid two thousands, where Minnesota was profiting four to five million for men's hockey, and they were million little, literally. You know, North Dakota was like second with like two million somewhere in there. It was way, it was just way out of proportion compared to the rest of the schools. It's a little different now, but I mean. You're clearing four and five million. That is a big chunk, Vegas. Yeah, and it it used to be more. And uh, U of M doesn't get parking revenue, as as Denny Gopher nice nice to point out here. Parking's a separate entity at the University of Minnesota, so that revenue doesn't go to athletics. But uh, you know, the numbers have been pretty good here at Minnesota for the last decade. Years, yeah. yeah, you know, I I think uh, there's still some room for them. It's not quite quite what it used to be, but well, they had a bigger team. Looking forward to base. the season yeah. ticket base was eight thousand back then. It's it wasn't. What's the season ticket base now, or what has it been the last couple of years? It's been about five, so five to forty five hundred. So, and I, you compare that to eighty five hundred back in the two, mid two thousands. Well, because they capped it because they wanted to have season ticket. Yeah, you know, single game tickets to sell. So, so yeah, it was it was it was a different beast. I got a one question that I, I probably should like pack. Um, <laughs> Me too. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Has anything changed with the way Minnesota plays or like Mariucci? Is it different now? That it's a eleven feet in width. Small. Like was it eighty nine by two hundred now? It is eighty nine by two hundred. Anything I think the changed? biggest Any, thing it forces it? is their power play has to be more aggressive. I think in the past on the big ice, they would hide out on the space and get content with possession and moving the puck around the perimeter. I think with the rink narrowing, they have to be more aggressive and they have to be more chaotic with their power play. And it's helped them be more consistent home and away because you always used to see them go on the road and struggle on the power play because there's just less space. 
you have to be more proactive with your chances. And I think they're more consistent in the style of play that they enact. And I do think they're a little bit more aggressive on the forecheck with the narrow rice at home before they were more content to set it up and let the dance come to them rather than go to the dance on time. I think they're just more aggressive, uh, especially in the penalty kill too. Like when they see opportunities to press high, they will. And then I don't think they would do that on the big sheet before they would just kind of sit back more. So those have been some of the things I've noticed. Um, I mean, the corners are by far the biggest adjustment there. There's not as much space there as there used to be. You used to be able to hide and be like, come on defense, come get me. And they can't do that anymore. Interesting. So well, I'm tired. I want to call it a night here myself. Okay. Uh, so yeah, good luck this weekend, Brian. We'll definitely come up and see you. <laughs> He's already disconnected. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I think my AirPods yeah. might have died. I think right I on time. It. It's all right good, on time. Man. We'll come up and say hello. We're we'll, we're right next to you anyway for the radio. So we'll come up and say hello and introduce ourselves. Thanks, Brian. All right, bye, folks.